Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Pascual Herraia. He is Professor of Paleontology and Paleoecology at the University of Naples, Federico II. His scientific interests concern the evolution and the dynamics of extinction of animal species, and in particular the fossils of hominid species. His most notable scientific contributions regard evolutionary theories about the evolution of insular species, the complexity of organisms, and the dynamics of extinction of hominids. And today we're going to talk about some of those topics. So, Dr. Raya, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. It's a great, a great pleasure for me to be introduced with such nice words. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So. Um, let's talk a little bit first about climate change and the impact it has on the evolution of species. So, um, what impact does it have really uh, in, evol in evolution? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. You know, the bottom line for species to, to make a living is to find a place where they can live and thrive and produce babies. And climate does determine most of the places where you can uh, actually uh, live, uh, live your life. And competition being competition and predation be the other factors which uh, naturally impinges on the um, chance to make a living in a given place. When the climate change, it is expected that the species will either move or somehow adapt to the changing climates. So species are in sort of a um, continuous update of their genome and their phenotype just to respond to the climate changing. Because uh, uh, that's a fact that the climate changes uh, almost continuously. Sometimes these changes are quite sharp and rapid. Some other times uh, they are slower. But no matter how fast it is, how intense it is, you have to adapt to the change, either by moving or otherwise by developing some uh, device, so to speak. Uh, basically, it's, it's natural selection. You have to adapt to, 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 the, to the new condition once you face that. And I would imagine that one thing that can happen when there's climate change is also that some species might uh, thrive in the new conditions, right? Some of them will thrive, some of them will uh, rank high up in the, in the biological ladder uh, within the ecosystem. Some others, of course, are doomed just because the changes are either too fast or they have not enough uh, resources uh, in terms of, of um, genotypic variants to adapt to the changing conditions. Mm -hmm. And so, when it comes specifically to the extinction of species, do we know the factors that drive it? Well, uh, it's a quite complex, complex matter. Uh, of course, uh, as I was saying before, uh, it is expected in a sense that the climate do change. And species do, do have some, some kind of... Uh, possibility to react because the genome is usually endowed with enough variants to, to face the new condition. Some alleles, which means some, some individuals within the population may react well, some others will react uh, not so well to the changing conditions and, and just changing frequencies and the end eventually phenotypes. Do we observe this change, this adaptation, this continuous adaptation to changing, to changing conditions? But uh, some other times the change is either too fast or too, just too sudden or too intense. Or, and the, the genetic reservoir is not good enough, it's not large enough to, to face the change. And in these particular conditions, uh, uh, climate may actually drive species to extinctions. Uh, many other times uh, climate change has nothing to do with, with the extinction process. Uh, it could be that geological changes, for example, are not climatic in the strict sense, most of them, but can uh, equally they, they can be equally powerful drivers of extinctions, especially in particular moments uh, of the geo geologic evolution of the planet. And so uh, species adapt to particular environments, and so they specialize 
to those environments, I think we could say. Uh, does in, is increased specialization a problem or can it be a problem? I guess it is. Uh, I have even published some paper to, to try to demonstrate it is. It is a well-known uh, a long-held tenet of the evolutionary theory that too much specialization is a tech good. The reason is that uh, when you are very specialized to thrive in a particular environment, especially if that environment is itself extreme, in a sense, uh, you are reducing the chance to, um, to respond effectively to future climate change. Take the polar bear as an, as an example. It has a, a very large and, and thick skin and a particularly uh, dense fur. Of course, when, when that climate uh, it thrives in, is, uh, does change because, because of, uh, that's what is going on right now with, with current climate change. Of course, that specialization that allowed the, the polar bear to live in the Arctic can actually be the biggest problem for its future if the if its environment does reduces does reduce because of, of climate change. Mm -hmm. It is a worrisome aspect of, of climate change of the current climate change, which regards most Arctic species, not just the polar bear. Mm -hmm. And about the evolution of hominins specific, specifically, what do we know about how climate change might have impacted it in positive or negative ways, of course? Well, I, if you ask me, of course, my, my reply would be that, the, that climate change actually drew the extinction some of the uh, of our lost cousins. The Neanderthals are an example, or Erectus yet, yet another example. Uh, I, I would say, though, that uh, climate change can also offer opportunities, opportunities to exploit new environments and new way of living. This is particularly true for uh, species endowed with great brain power, like, of course, it is true for home species. And our reaction to climate change uh, is, of course, expected to be quite different from from better water mammals to stay close to home. Uh, and the main reason for that is that we, we are endowed with culture. We can, we can, uh, of course, we can produce our own clothes to fend off the effect of climate change when it got, when it got too cold. But despite that, I uh, did collect evidence with my collaborators uh, in the very last few years that climate change actually was affecting the extinction of our species except Homo sapiens, because somehow Homo sapiens was able to withstand the effect of climate change in the latest Pleistocene when, when the climate change was the most intense. Uh, speaking of ice ages, of the um, continuous warm of the climate from, from warm to extremely cold conditions. Somehow we found a way to survive and thrive on the planet almost uh, uh, alone um, among, among the, the homo species, that there is no other homo species, of course, during the last uh, 20,000 years or so. Uh, and I actually think that we took the opportunity to exploit climate change in a sense by trying to adapt to the local condition as we face it then. And of course, culture is the, the main reason I can put forward Without any demonstration, of course, but it's the main reason I can put forward for this great success that Homo sapiens and all the Homo sapiens uh, did enjoy. And do you think that, uh, so talking about culture, that climate change and climate fluctuations during the Pleistocene might have uh, driven the evolution of human culture in a way or not? Yeah, of course, because uh, culture is material culture in particular, is finding new solutions, which is tantamount for defining intelligence in a particular case of Homo sapiens. So as, as the climate change was offering new conditions, was changing the ecosystems, we had to find solutions. And most of these solutions were actually found in culture, in cultural innovations. Think of 
to, to get back in time. Think of uh, mastering of fire, producing clothes, producing shelters. Those are all factors that, that are actually present. We enjoy thanks to cultural innovations and Homo sapiens was particularly well endowed to uh, produce new solutions like those. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you mentioned some of the species that went extinct there and some of them possibly due to climate change, you mentioned Neanderthals. So, but what was really, what really distinguished Neanderthals from Homo sapiens in uh, and what explains why one of those species went extinct and hers, Homo sapiens, we are still here. I mean, because there were many similarities, right? Yeah, uh, you know, I know, I wish there were a simple and straight question. There isn't any. If you ask this, if you pose this same question to our, say, uh, an anthropologist in, uh, back in the 50s, the, the answer would be quite simple. The answer would be something like uh, Neanderthals were not as intelligent as, as we are. But the point is that the, in the last few decades of research in anthropology and on Neanderthals in, in particular, we did put forward evidence that they were quite intelligent. They were really, really, really intelligent. They can produce glue, they can produce material culture, probably they had some form of art, some form of art and even burials, which means that they had any concept of the, of the outward and the afterlife. And in addition, we are, we are gaining genetic evidence that most encounters with uh, uh, Homo sapiens were not violent, which is the basic expectation when a, a superior competitor, competitor, so to speak, does encounter a, a lower competition, competitor. Uh, because you know that we have some uh, DNA, uh, Neanderthal DNA in our genes, which means that uh, they have there were repeated instances of, of uh, um, intercourse, so to speak, between the two species. So it's non-violent by definition, I would say. And in the last few years, we really got these uh, new nuance of thinking at Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. They were, for sure, they were um, endowed with some form of deep culture, most like sapiens. Maybe it's a, a great difference. They were not as smart as we were. Probably they were reacting more slowly to the changing condition as compared to, to the sapiens. I guess that was the key factor, if you ask me. I have no evidence for that, of course, it's just, it's just a, a, an educated guess, nothing more. But I, I really believe that the reaction was a little bit slower but despite this difference was actually small, it had enormous consequences. Uh, somehow Neanderthals, which were rare to begin with, uh, by the end of the Pleistocene were uh, absorbed, so to speak, uh, into, into the expanding sapiens population. Mm -hmm. But do you think it could have had something to do with the fact that they weren't able to develop cultural tools to deal with uh, climate change as we were or or do you think it had not uh, nothing to do with culture itself or the ability to produce uh, culture? It, if you ask me it, 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 it has to do with culture not with intelligence mm -hmm. most of what we refer to as culture actually is exchange of ideas mm -hmm. But when you get a, a very small population, fragmented and isolated into, into um, extremely small subpopulations, the opportunity to exchange ideas, new ways of producing tools and clothes, the, the chance that you react as fast as it takes to the changing climate is, you are really on thin ice. In that case, with such a slow innovation, uh, chances that you will not react good enough and fast enough to the new condition. 
So it's not that the Neanderthals were not clever enough, it's that they were too few and they had little opportunity to exchange ideas between each other. I guess this is a key factor, very hard to investigate upon, but it must have been a factor, definitely. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the intelligence side of things, uh, you even have a recent paper where you uh, talk about how Homo sapiens and Neanderthals uh, apparently share high cerebral cortex integration into adulthood, so that has uh, something to do with it or not? Well, well you know, uh, do we have some time to explain? Y yes, of course. <laughs> You'll take some minutes. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay, uh, point is, uh, it, you know, saying that uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals had, had quite large, have or that had quite large brain is quite simple and obvious. It's a truism, it's something that mm -hmm. nobody can question, of course. Yeah. But science is, doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, for, for once, it doesn't tell why we are here talking and, the other, and there is no Neanderthal around, uh, despite the fact that their brain was as large as ours, is, if not a little bit higher in, in, uh, in proportion to the body size. In that paper in particular, we were interested not just in to tell uh, which species has, has the, largest, the largest brain, how this large brain size developed. We were interested in understanding how the brain grows and whether different, different areas of the brain do communicate between each other. Uh, now, they communicate um, not as a, as a fact. It's, we, we did not measure communication. Uh, what we looked after was to see whether different, um, different areas areas of the brain cortex do grow or change in concerto, meaning that there is cooperation, as, as we say, between the changes in one area as compared to the other areas as well. And we found that there is a high degree of integration, uh, especially attached to the, to the clade of, of homo. Homo in general, not just sapiens and neanderthals. Uh, from that very observation, which suggests uh, that the different brain areas uh, on the cortex can uh, somehow communicate, are somehow interconnected to one another, we moved a step forward trying to understand how these uh, shape connection, because it's actually a connection of shapes uh, of the different areas, uh, did grow during the, the ontogeny, actually. The autogeny is that period from, from, from birth to sexual maturity. Uh, we, we had the data from some, for some species, that, that kind of data of course is quite rare. We have the data from some species, not for others. In particular we tested Homo sapiens of course and the other apes, great apes. And what we found is that uh, up, to, up to an age, and just before sexual maturity, all the apes are, have quite integrated brains. Uh, we are no special as, as we compared to the other apes in that regard. The level of integration is always large. But when sexual maturity comes up, when it, it realizes all the other apes immediately lose connection, lose this high level of integration all of them except Homo sapiens. So we were left with, with this particular observation, Homo sapiens only have, has this high level of, in, of integration between the cortical areas throughout ontogeny. Neanderthals have very high level of integration as adults as well. So the, 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 the logics suggest that Neanderthals had, had a, a pattern of growth in terms of brain integration, most like those of Homo sapiens. And this retention of why uh, integration into handle tool is suggestive of some form of deep communication between these areas, which reminds me 
of a, a, a theory of Brit, uh, British archaeologists back in the days. Uh, uh, the name is Stephen Mitten, the, the theory of cognitive fluidity. The idea that uh, humans can mix different domains of intelligence uh, to produce new ideas and new solutions. And our data just suggests that Neanderthals were endowed with the same uh, capability, uh, the same ability to produce new ideas as humans are. Which is one, yet another reason why I was telling you before that it's not the individual on the other top. They were quite intelligent. I would bet everything on that. Uh, it's, it's a matter of the opportunity to introduce novelties when a population is that rare and that isolated and fragmented as it, as it was the case with the other times. But I mean, a cerebral cortex integration, uh, does it uh, relate in any way then with cognitive ability? Yeah, of course. Of course. In humans, there is emerging evidence that uh, the actual, it ju it's just not uh, the covariance of parts as we measure it. The, the human brain is hardwired for strong connection between distant areas of the brain. Uh, in a in a way, uh, uh, to a degree that no other no other primates seem to share, and so it's very likely that this has something to do with our creativity, in particular, with our ability to find new solution, to imagine new solution by by means of abstract thought. Think of language, for example. Uh, and I guess Neanderthals were endowed. Our data, at least, very. They, they suggest that Neanderthals were endowed with this same ability. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just going back a little bit to the question surrounding why Neanderthals went extinct and not Homo sapiens, I mean, do, do you think uh, among all the different hypotheses that are out there, do you think that it would have mostly to do then with what you mentioned earlier, like, for example, the fact that they have lower population density or I mean because in terms of uh, cognition and in terms of uh, so, uh, sociability and all of that I, I mean are there really is, is there really evidence that there was there were big differences or no I, I um, allow me to repeat myself I really believe that mm -hmm. it's a matter of how fast new ideas can spread Mm -hmm. uh, how fast the react the contrary reaction to the to the changing climates, the right. changing conditions. By the way, because there is another Homo species coming in your, in your backyard. In the case of Neanderthals, no? uh, I guess they had not the opportunity to react fast. It's not individual. It's not a, a problem of individual Neanderthals. It's the fact, and and we actually published a paper on that. The population was was highly fragmented into isolated and distant subpopulation. In that particular condition, the, the chance that you can spread ideas and new solutions, new uh, ways to produce material culture rapidly is very thin. So thin that by the end of the day, the sapiens uh, took the, the upper end. Mm -hmm. So but another thing I, that sorry, sorry if I interrupt. No, no, no problem. Uh, another thing that I read about in your book is uh, how apparently niche construction might also have played a role in Homo sapiens being able to increase its habitable area. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, of course. When when you think at the ecological niche, the ecological niche is uh, um, the concept actually tries to capture what the species does, how it does, where it does, under which condition, condition it does. Uh, in the particular case of species endowed with culture, you have to add modification of the habitat uh, that, that culture brings about, which is especially true of all species, of course. This uh, cultural niche is an expansion of the climatic nature, the ecological niche in, in the in a common sense, uh, it, it's an expansion that is given by culture. So when you find new solution in terms of 
heating, heating the place where you live, producing featured clothes, producing uh, effective or waterproof or cold proof shelters actually allows you to expand uh, the habitable area when you can make a living and even connect areas which will be isolated otherwise. That continuity of population of, of uh, gene exchange and of cultural innovation exchange, ideas, ideas exchange, really by the end of the gate homo sapiens the upright. And it's it's a present we uh, rip it off of culture, of ideas, by exchanging, by communicating. And this is true of, of Homo sapiens and Homo sapiens only in the, in the, our, in the history of our lineage. Mm -hmm. So would you say that this was probably the main mechanism, in this case culture and niche construction, that allowed us to spread all over the world or almost the entire world? I mean, from Africa to Eurasia and then to the Americas, Oceania and all of that. Uh, I would say a full yes. Uh, we get traces of this uh, ability to overcome the, the limitation of imposed by climate change, even in older species, uh, even in late, uh, in middle, middle to late Pleistocene species like Homo heidelbergensis or Mortz. But in the particular case of, of Homo sapiens, both the climate uh, change was becoming more intense and the species was the best in terms of its ability to react to the changing conditions. And the end product of this process, if you uh, think of it in retrospection, can only be that that very single species was the only one to survive. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I would like to ask you a little bit about the extinction of Pleistocene megafauna, because I mean, there's, at least as far as I understand it, some evidence that Homo sapiens might have played some role there, because I mean, there's at least a coincidence between the arrival of Homo sapiens at particular areas like the Americas and Australia, the Oceania in general, uh, and the extinction of some megafauna, but uh, I mean, is, uh, do you think that that was the main factor or uh, climate change, climate fluctuations might have also played a role there? Ah, you know what? Well, the, the, the human mind uh, has a crush for simple, simple answer, <laughs> like black or white. It, it, it's uh, always like that in natural sciences. Yeah. It's really like that. Uh, I mean, the, the, the real answer. Uh, I guess uh, what we refer to as pre-naivety was a big factor. Uh, let me explain. Um, there are some places where the megafauna had uh, a very long opportunity to know, so to speak, how humans behave. Uh, think of Africa, think of most of, of Eurasia, especially in the western side. Uh, in these areas, there is climate change, especially uh, at high latitudes, and very little impact in terms of uh, megafauna extinction, um, especially in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other end, in places where humans first arrived, like, like uh, Oceania and the uh, American continent, of course, that species were uh, entirely naive to the new super predator. And you know, most mammals do sides up the, 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 the chance that uh, an individual of another species could be threatening or not, judging on sides. And we are not so special in terms of sides, of course, compared to, to a megafauna species. We are quite small by the megafauna standards. So I guess it's uh, very likely that the, the, the flight distance, the, the anti-predator anti behavior of these species in the Americas and in Oceania was quite naive and quite simplistic in terms of when they did encounter uh, late Pleistocene hunters. And this was, uh, if you ask me, one of the main reasons why they, they fall easy prey 
of those antennas. Just because they didn't react, they started to 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 fly off too late at too short a distance, and they were just easy to kill. But that's not true in, in Eurasia and in, in Africa. So it's kind of a mixed blessing. Uh, having been so long with, with humans mean, means, of course, being exposed to the human tradition for a longer time. But if you really have to try to understand megafauna uh, extinction, I guess you cannot rule out entirely uh, neither climate change, neither uh, human overhunting. Uh, with the caveats that overhunting is very important, where prey were naive uh, to human hunters, but not in the old world. Mm -hmm. So we can't really say that one single factor drove them to extinction. I mean, no, it was a combination of probably in some places human arrival and also climate change. Yeah, you got it perfectly. More on the human side in the in the Americas and Oceania, and probably more the climate side in the old world. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to ask you about one last topic then. I also read in your work about uh, the relationship between uh, morphological integration and functional performance. So, first of all, could you explain to us each of those concepts and if there's a relationship between them? Well, uh, it, it's yet another complicated matter. Your attention for it. <laughs> uh, natural selection is, is expected to to make structure, biological structure, more effective for what they do. Uh, they function a role, as, as, we, as we say. Uh, so in a sense, you are expected that different parts of a biological entities, which are, which are recruited for a single function, are highly integrated, uh, meaning that they have to be highly coordinated in terms of how they move and work uh, just to produce the, the best possible outcome. Of course, things are not that simple because producing that outcome means specialization, which also means that uh, the more you are specialized for a single function, the, the less likely you are to switch to another function or to adapt to slightly different conditions. So on the one side, you expect high, high, high levels of integration, and you basically find it. On the other side, uh, it's true that uh, selection for variability, so to speak, does prevent um, parts, parts of, the, of our biological entity to be ideally constructed to perform their own function. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, if there's more morphological integration, for, for example, uh, if there's more morphological integration, does that have any sort of implication for how well a species can readapt to new conditions? I mean, does it make it, uh, does it, make it harder for it to change or readapt its morphology, for example? Yeah, it makes it really hard because the, the more you get extreme in terms of phenotype, the lower the chance that you get back. Uh, um, and by get back, I mean adapting to, to new conditions or, or, or even to a new function. Uh, of course, the, in, in, in reality, in true colors, uh, things are a little bit more complicated. Sometimes uh, those structures appear, uh, appear really extreme in terms of, 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 of their shapes and, and the way they function, but in reality they are still able to perform the, the same function differently or even different functions. Sometimes that's a, 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 it's a bit tricky just to look at the, how extreme the shapes are, but it's true, the, the, bottom line, the bottom line remains true. When you lose variability, you can probably perform very well in the place where you are, in the time where you live, 
but the chance that you react and change to changing conditions is really, really thin. And by the end of the day, this means that if you are too much specialized and do not retain enough genotypic variants, by the end of the day, this means that you are really sowing the branch you're sitting up on. Uh, it, it is a matter of time, but, but some time that the conditions will change and you will be not, no longer able to react. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, the way uh, uh, the, a morphology of a particular species uh, operates, I mean, if it's more or less integrated and the way the species develops also has an impact on its evolution, right? Yeah, of course it does. Uh, both in terms of the phenotype, because the phenotype does appear uh, extreme in a sense, if you allow me this term. Uh, but on the other end, it, it can actually uh, make the extinction risk higher, at least in the long run. So, so long as the condition, conditions do not change, natural selection is expected to favor such ex extreme specialization whether or not it comes by, uh, by means of, of uh, morphological integration. But of course, once the condition changes, and I repeat myself, uh, it's like sowing the branches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was asking you that because I was just wondering if these might tie to some, let's say, evo devo approaches to evolutionary biology because there are many people that argue that, in fact, development also conditions um, evolution. Yeah, a lot, a lot. The, the field is vivid and is producing fantastic new papers and insights on a yearly basis. And in addition, we are now understanding better than before that the environment also have, uh, uh, has a, a, a strong impact, a strong influence on how the, phen the phenotype comes about, comes about. and, and uh, I mean, what the species actually will do uh, in their ecosystems actually depends on their genome, of course, but also depends on chance and on the effect of the environment. So it's kind of the other way around. We, we used to think that uh, the natural selection was just a selection of particular alleles, alleles and genes, but we're now understanding and making uh, a better use of the notion that the environment you grow in actually has an influence, has a big impact on, 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 the, on the end product, I mean, on the adult phenotype. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Raya, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Oh, it's the, the, the usual channels. I mean, uh, go, to, go for Google Scholar, that's always mm -hmm. good, <laughs> because it's super cheap. It's actually things with, it comes with no cost. Uh, otherwise, if you want to pay me a visit, I'm based at the Naples, at the University of Naples, in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And I'll be glad to, to chat or meet anybody who will be interested in my research. Okay, so thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It was a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Ricardo. It was great. I enjoyed my time. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. You will find links to it in the description box of this interview. And also, please share the interview, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perelga Larsen, Jerry Mueller, Ernst Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henrik Alenius, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windager, Rui Nassio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, João Linhares, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Eira, 
Tom Hamill, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londoño Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Ostasevski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Martin Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mal Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Cloacchi, Georgius Theophanes, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Moray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herringbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Tom Roth, DRPMD, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson and Chris Story. A special thanks to my producers Isa Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Igni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumpel, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Alni Cortez, and to my executive producers Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codrean and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.